Welcome to Digital Asset News, taking the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and breaking them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, got some interesting articles. First up, Ripple CTO David Schwartz explains whether XRP can be destroyed or not. And the question is asked, is XRP truly decentralized also? A power plant in New York is producing natural gas and Bitcoin. And Ethereum is the main project pushing the industry forward, ratings agency remarks on Ethereum, and why I believe these three reasons are going to push Ethereum potentially into the number one spot also. Tezos successfully activated Carthage, its third protocol update. XTZ price surpasses $3. And the question for myself is, will I be adding Tezos to my portfolio? And finally, let's go over the scam of the day. So again, thanks everybody who has participated. I truly appreciate it. We've uh, taken care of a lot of scams, gotten rid of them. So I'm really happy with that. But we will go over this at the very end of today's stories. But let's get into it. So first up, David Schwartz, the CTO of Ripple, reveals whether validators can destroy all XRP tokens that the company holds in its escrow wallet. So this is a question I never even thought about. Could XRP actually be destroyed? David Schwartz, the chief technical officer of the blockchain company Ripple, who also happens to be the main architect of its proprietary software, answered some questions on Twitter about creating or destroying XRP. The total circulating supply, as a reminder for everybody, of XRP stands at 100 billion tokens with nearly 60% of it locked in Ripple's escrow wallet. And if you're not familiar, uh, Ripple did a great little thing at the end of uh, 2017, beginning of 2018, where they locked up their remaining uh, amount of XRP tokens into a smart contract, which would be released every month at 1 billion XRP tokens. And it was able to be bought up by uh, the retail investor. Uh, lately, they've actually done it every single month and they've put the billion dollars or the billion XRP tokens out there and they've actually put it right back into escrow with only a small amount being sold to institutions. Now, when I read this, uh, my first thought was, first of all, I thought it was only 50 billion now. Uh, this story is saying it's 60 billion. So for everybody who's into XRP, which I know there's a lot of you, let me know what the answer is in the comments section below. But I could have sworn it was 50 or 55 billion, somewhere around there, but not 60 billion. And then the second question I have is, as far as XRP investors, which I am one of those, would you feel more comfortable if that 50 billion was not held by one entity and that one entity is Ripple. Wouldn't it be something you would like to see that these XRP tokens were not um, condensed or put into the hands of one type of company such as Ripple? Now me myself, I would love that to happen. However, if that to happen, it's kind of a sticky situation because you can't just dump all these XRP tokens on the market. That would flood the market and the price would go to zero. So I think right now the best option that is out there is uh, for this smart contract to put these out every month for institutions to pick up. And you know, hopefully as time goes on, it becomes a little bit more uh, less and less. But that's the question I have for you. Let me know in the comments section. Moving on. So David Schwartz essentially was asked, hey, can we destroy these and how does this all work? Uh, can we get frozen or locked out? And he states in the, in the Twitter here, he says, there's no mechanism in the software to create XRP and safeties to prevent it from being created by a bug or trick. There's no freeze or lock for other people's XRP since nobody would be entitled to that capability. You can easily lock or destroy your own XRP if you wish. So, I mean, that's interesting if you want to, you know, uh, buy XRP and then destroy it. I guess you're free to do that. Um, I don't know why anybody would uh, if you own it, but um, that's uh, an option for you if you're into destroying uh, your hard-earned money. So whatever. But it does it does come on to, off to say that uh, if validators potentially revolt against Ripple and choose to burn its escrow holdings, the server that powers the XRP ledger would simply count them as disagreeing ones, which could potentially halt the network. Schwartz claimed that changing the rules would require a hard fork. And there's uh, more down here, but it gets a little more technical, so I'm going to bypass that. But this was interesting because it talks about hard forks. And hard forks only apply to decentralized projects. Uh, if XRP was centralized, Ripple could do whatever they wanted to, right? with impunity. And it wouldn't really matter. They wouldn't need to have these validators run anything or have a consensus. It would be like, no, we're doing it uh, because we're centralized. But um, in the comments section previously in some other videos, people have been stating quite emphatically 
that XRP is very centralized. But I'm telling you here right now, here is the CTO saying, look, we can't just do anything we want to. We have a consensus. We have validators. If this happens, then we can fork. But it's the same way across the board with other uh, cryptocurrency digital assets. So the question that I always get is, is XRP decentralized? So I'll tell you like this. There is a um, on the xrpcharts.ripple.com. You can take a look at all their validators. And uh, these are essentially, I mean, it's a consensus. It's consensus. It's kind of like nodes for Bitcoin. And uh, there's tons of them. There's over 150. And uh, yes, uh, Ripple does have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six uh, uh, as being part of these validators. But besides that, it's pretty a big line of swath of different individuals and whatnot of validators. So for the question that I always have, as far as centralized versus decentralized is if we could just look at you know is how many nodes there are how many validators how many uh, blockchain producers if you uh, this will kind of lead us to that that final conclusion of what is centralized versus decentralized but really i think it goes beyond that i think there's really three things in my mind that would determine if something is centralized or decentralized because if we just look at this uh, xrp is totally decentralized right and uh, before we go on, I will just tell you my holdings right now. Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, Chainlink, Cardano, and EOS. So um, if I talk about these a lot, it's because I'm biased and uh, I'm very honest about that. But you have to ask the questions, right? You have to ask the questions for your investments to make sure you're going in the right direction. And uh, I'm not married to any one thing. I'm not a maximalist whatsoever. I mean, I'm a maximalist to making money, I suppose, but... <laughs> But I'm not, I'm not married to any one project. So when I look at this, we look at validators and nodes, yeah, decentralized. However, if I take a look at the concentration of coins, um, if you're an XRP holder, you can't deny that fact. That look, there's a lot of XRP tokens and it is in the hands of Ripple. Now, as time moves on, these things will change. But as it stands right now, if you have to look at it, you got to tell, you got to say to yourself, look, XRP has got a centralization of a lot of their tokens. I mean, 50% at a minimum, it's a lot. Does that mean anything? Eh, it depends on who you ask, and that's a debate for maybe uh, another topic, but you cannot deny that that is what it is. So if we look at conservation of coins, eh, it's kind of shaky. Now, looking at mining, well, XRP was pre-mined, so we don't have that issue right here. But these are the three types of things that I look at as far as like if it's decentralized or centralized or not. Now, if we could expand on this topic real quick to one of my other investments, Bitcoin. Uh, as far as validators or nodes, uh, Bitcoin has, I think, the most out of anybody. I think it's like 10,000 or 100,000 nodes out there globally. So there's a ton of nodes out there, way more than uh, even XRP. So that's great. But the problem is, in, in some ways I see it, whales, wallets. There's a concentration of Bitcoin in certain individuals. And I don't believe that was the initial intent, uh, but that is what it is. So if you look at that, and I believe firmly that whales manipulate this, this market heavily. And uh, hopefully as time goes on, we have less and less whales, but uh, who knows? Who knows what could happen? Again, another debate, another video. So if we look at that, I'm kind of looking at Bitcoin. There's a problem there. Now, as far as concentration of mining, this is where it gets interesting. So if you look at mining, um, let me go up here real quick. There's a there's a difference between mining pools and individual miners. And someone had to correct me that on one of my comments section. <laughs> so thank you for that. But uh, yeah, we look at mining pools. Look, it's concentrated in China. No one can deny that, right? Huge amount of in China, 81%, Czech Republic, Iceland, da 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 da. Great. So we take a look at this, like where is it all? Who are these companies? Well, you got pool and an F2 pool, which is about roughly 33%, 34%, somewhere around there. Then you have BTC.com and Ant Pool, which is, a, which is, which is essentially Bitmain. Um, Bitmain, just real quick, one of the large uh, mining pools. BTC.com and Ant Pool make the company also operates those two. So we can fit those squarely uh, into that. But you have to understand, there are mining pools, and that's just uh, where individual miners pool all their hash power together, and it makes it a little bit, uh, definitely, actually, I think a lot more profitable 
if they can pool all of their resources together. So um, if Antpool or BTC.com has some problem with that, individual miners, they can just pull out and go, well, we're going to go with uh, Bytepool or Huobipool or whatever the heck's out there. So that's one of those things where, I mean, yes, there is a centralization of the mining pools, but the actual individual miners, eh, not so much. However, there is still another question for me, and that is how many individual mining rigs do these pools own? Because it's not like they're just sitting there with like one computer and they're having all these different miners uh, throughout around the globe. I mean, if you look at Bitmain itself, just Google Bitmain. I mean, here's their factories. I mean, they're huge and they have enormous rigs out there, right? Just rows and rows and rows of rigs. So, I mean, how many are there? I have no idea, but, uh, you know, uh, that is what it is now. So my final thoughts are this. To me, uh, Bitcoin is way more decentralized. Uh, if you look at the big three questions we just asked, but I do believe that XRP is decentralized and will continue to become more decentralized every month with the escrow uh, dropping out uh, a billion per month for actually not just retail investors, but uh, for institutions. I think institutions are really buying those things up. Uh, and sometimes, you know, per month, uh, Ripple will, or actually, that's not Ripple, the smart contract will allow those billion to two drop out to be purchased, but it'll be put right back into escrow. So we will see. Now, will Bitmain, the question I also have is, uh, will Bitmain and these Chinese mining pools take over mining? So this leads me to my next article, where we take a look at a uh, power plant in New York, produces natural gas and also Bitcoin. So it's interesting to see how the whole economy is shifting. And this is a great example. So a power plant in New York's Finger Lakes region has set up its own Bitcoin mining operation using the electricity it produces to generate about $50,000 worth of the virtual currency every day. This was an article from Bloomberg, so they don't use some of the lingo that we're used to. Uh, Atlas Holding LLC installed some 7,000 crypto mining machines at the Greenage Greenage generation plant in recent months that can mine about five and a half bitcoins per day. So imagine that you got 7,000 mining machines, and for all that hash that hash rate, that mining power, you get five and a half bitcoins per day. Amazing. So this is a 65,000 square foot facility in Dresden, New York, it was built in 1937 as a coal plant, and later converted to natural gas. Miners have been roaming the world seeking out cheap electricity, such as that available from hydropower plants. Many were met with an unwelcome surprise when those utilities jacked up prices. But Greener said its power costs are predictable and low, essentially just the costs of production. The server farm consumes about 15 megawatts of the 106 megawatts of, of capacity. Uh, while in the plant, the plant used to only run during times of peak energy demand. This is where it gets interesting. So... It would only run during the summer or winter when there was a peak energy demand. Other than that, it was offshot to some other different type of power plant. So they were just kind of like, if we need excess, we will use this power plant, you know, the uh, state of New York. But now with the uh, Bitcoin mining, it operates year round and is much more profitable. While all the Bitcoin miners are going to be impacted by the so-called halvening slated for May, when rewards and network issues to miners will be cut in half, the plant's owners believe they will still remain in the black or profitable. They state we're in a favorable market position regardless of how the halving materializes, said Tim Rainey, CFO at Greenage. Due to our unique position as a co-generation facility, we're able to make money in a down market. So it all comes to this. It all kind of comes down to this. When the halving kicks in, smaller mining operations will shut down because they just haven't either they haven't saved enough or they haven't planned well and it's going to be because right now it is for every block that you mine you get 12 and a half bitcoin but in around may 12 may 13th from one day to the next it's the same energy output it's the same effort it's the same everything but you're only going to get 6.25 so that is a problem because all the energy that you're taking, all the money that you take to mine one Bitcoin or one block, now it just gets cut in half. So if you're a miner, I read an article that talked about how it could be around $12,500 just to break even. So you got to imagine these places, 
like Bitmain, who just have rows and rows of rigs, and they're probably stockpiling Bitcoin like crazy. They're going to ride this out as time after the halving for like two, three, four months or however long it takes for the price to rise. And if it doesn't rise, then that could be a potential problem and more miners will shut off their rigs. I don't think that'll happen. I think what's going to happen is they're going to ride out the storm. They're going to wait till it becomes profitable and all those other uh, smaller types of pools or small smaller types of uh, uh, mining operations, those four months that they were out, well, they're not going to have any Bitcoin to sell. Now, when these guys go to sell, like, hey, we sell, we mined in a down market. Now it's, uh, and we have a Bitcoin for 20, 30, 40,000. Now we can make profits. And I think the same thing's gonna happen with Bitmain. Same thing's gonna happen here. And with those bigger operations, like that gigawatt factory that's gonna come out in Midland, Texas, uh, sometime this year. So we will see. I'll also say one more thing about that, which is that as these smaller uh, operations drop out, that means that the hash rate will go down. When the hash rate drops, difficulty drops, and that becomes less expensive for big operations, and they become even more profitable. So again, big oper operations like this probably have reserve money in HODL until the market skyrockets and make a killing. That's it for that. Let's move on. Next up, ETH is the main project pushing the industry forward. Ratings agency remarks on Ethereum. This is from the Weiss ratings. So in a blog post earlier this week, outspoken Bitcoin bull Anthony Pompliano drew parallels between Ethereum and fiat money. According to Pomp, the logic that Ethereum's money is fundamentally flawed. He explained the newsletter. And I'm not going to read it. Basically, Pomp doesn't know what he's talking about. He talks about Ethereum being money because he can only see things, uh, cryptocurrency as currency. It's a digital asset. Ethereum is for smart contracts. It's going to be huge, and it's going to be huge in three ways, which I'm going to get to in a second. So it talks here, it seems like U.S.-based ratings agency Weiss Ratings also felt the need to chime in on the conversation. Weiss affirmed that Ethereum is currently the main project that is driving the cryptocurrency industry forward. It is the, the, burp, the birthplace, or Ethereum, of many dApps and smart contracts and financial services, like insurance and lending. Other blockchains providing similar services have since emerged, since such as EOS and Tron, but Ethereum remains king. And if you, and if you are aware of my holdings, I mean, half of them have to deal with smart contracts. EOS, Cardano, Ethereum, smart contracts. It's going to be the future, and it's going to push uh, the market capitalization higher than it's ever been before. But in a tweet, Weo's crypto rating state states, we've seen people call ETH fiat money while praising governments for their efforts to introduce their own digital currencies like it relates to crypto. Right now, ETH is the main project pushing our industry forward. Whether you want to build or trade ETH, this is where it's at. So to break it all down, what they said a little bit better. Why? Why is Ethereum pushing everything? What's going on behind the scenes? Well, first of all, there's three reasons. There's just three reasons. It's because there's so many projects built on top of Ethereum. The second one is decentralized finance, and the third one is gaming. So let's get into it. So as far as like building on top of Ethereum, if you look at, this is from etherscan.io slash tokens, the token for Ethereum is ERC20, right? This is the token tracker of all ERC20s. These are all the ERC20 tokens. Everything that has been built essentially on Ethereum in the ERC20 format. So you can see Tether, BNB, Chainlink, Huobi token, Bitfinex, Hedge, Maker, USD Cohen, Crypto.com, Bat. I mean, it just goes on and on forever. So these are the projects that are on the ERC20 token or are going to be transferred off, whichever it was. They were all built on the Ethereum mainnet on the ERC20 token. And so as time goes on, you're going to see more projects built on top of Ethereum. Remember, these, this uh, really got steam around 2016, 2017 and beyond. So as time goes on, it's just a lot of dApps, a lot of tokens, a lot of everything is going to be built on top of Ethereum. And we can see it right here. The second reason is DeFi, decentralized finance. And this is what's, and I did a video about this uh, about a month ago or so, where we talk about uh, DeFi, decentralized finance, is going to launch Ethereum to a trillion dollar valuation. And that's at a minimum a conservative price. So we will see exactly what happens, but it's one of those things where Ethereum is the forefront, and I believe it's going to be huge. And lastly, we see that things like gaming. Now, I was never a big believer in like gaming as far as like why it could build, but someone once said mass adoption will happen when you don't realize 
that blockchain is actually being used in the background the same way that we don't look at the web and we realize that, oh, it's a TCP IP and HTTPS. It's just a protocol. And before you know it, things are going to be built upon top of things. You're like, that doesn't look like blockchain that I know of. And it's going to be looking like this, gaming, stuff like uh, this sandbox game, which I did a video on actually a couple weeks ago, where they're just selling, you know, virtual land. This one was sold for 206000 I think they're already sold out. And if you don't, if you know things about esports, that's a multi-billion dollar industry uh, crossing the globe. So if you put all these three things together, I think Ethereum is a winner and it's going to push things. It can do so many things and we'll see exactly where it lands. Will it flip with Bitcoin? That's my question for you. Tell me what you think about in the comment section. You think Bitcoin is going to hold its number one spot from here until eternity? Or do you think Ethereum or some other, no, I just say Ethereum. You think Ethereum could flip it within the next, I don't know, year to five years? Let me know in the comment section. Let's move on. Last up, Tezos successfully activated Carthage, its third protocol update. XTC surpasses $3. So I've been hearing a lot about Tezos lately, and it makes me look at it a little bit more closely. Tezos, first of all, is another smart contract type of protocol, and I like smart contracts if you couldn't tell. This article talks about Carthage is the third system-wide protocol update on the Tezos blockchain. The first two system-wide updates were known as Athens and Babylon. The Athens activated, uh, demonstrated that cryptocurrencies do not have to choose between being stuck with alertly technological choices or protecting themselves against interference. Babylon made improvements to the network's consensus algorithm, its governance mechanism, and its smart contract functionality. Sounds pretty good. Carthage is more of a housekeeping update, containing a range of bug fixes and other small improvements, which includes a corrected formula, concerning rewards in the network. All of this stuff is boring to me, quite honestly. I don't really care so much, but this last, last sentence kind of brought it all together. Or excuse me, the last sentence is brought all together. The most significant change to come with the Carthage update is an increase in users' gas limits, which will now allow users to execute an increased number of smart contracts. I like that. Tezos has surged over 200% in the past four months. I really like that. With this, Tezo became one of the top performing cryptos in the market, while its market cap recently surpassed $2 billion, which places the project in the top 10 biggest crypto projects by market cap. And this was a sentence I was trying to think about. The fact that the Tezos egg ecosystem is being continually updated and improved shows that Tezos does, in fact, have what it takes to continue. So I had to think about this for a second. I'm like, exactly what is Tezos again? What does it do? Because there's, you know, a thousand different cryptocurrencies out there. So you can, uh, I'm going to leave a link in the description, but you can go to coinbase.com slash earn. And for every video that you watch, you get so much of uh, each different digital asset. So this one, it goes for about a minute and pretty much summarizes what interests me as far as digital assets goes. I are an intermediary. For example, this is Emma. She wants to send her friend Peter some cryptocurrency one year from today. To do this, she could pay a real-world escrow service to hold her money and process the transaction. Or instead, she could send her money to a smart contract on Tezos that handles the whole transaction for her automatically, all while allowing Peter to verify the funds and the date he'll receive them. Because smart contracts sometimes manage large amounts of money, Smart contract safety is very important. Hackers might find a bug in a contract's code and exploit it to access the funds in the contract. Or people might send money to an improperly coded smart contract and never get it back. Both of these issues have occurred on other blockchains in the past and remain an obstacle to mainstream adoption of cryptocurrency. To help prevent this, Tezos improves safety by facilitating smart contracts that can be formally verified. Formal verification is a technique that allows developers to mathematically prove the correctness of their code and ensure that it will behave as intended. It's increasingly useful in areas that rely on mission-critical code, such as the aerospace, nuclear, transportation, and finance industries. Sounds good to me. Sounds like a winner. So I never really thought about that. I'm like, yeah, that's true. If you incorrect, incorrectly code this smart contract, it could screw up royally. You could lose your money or someone could dip into it and steal your funds. And I think as time goes on, the biggest thing 
is going to be some type of safety in how they actually execute these smart contracts flawlessly without screwing up too bad to where the general public is like, these things are worthless. So I like that looking at Tezos. So my question is, should I add this to my portfolio? Tell me what you think about that in the comment section. And that is it for today's video. So thanks for sticking with the rants. Really appreciate it. If you've got time, give me a couple minutes so we can go over the scam of the day. So the scam of the day, uh, if you're new to cryptocurrency, just know that everything's a scam. Uh, if you think that someone's trying to give you free money, they're not. Uh, if you think that Ripple is uh, doing a nice uh, little giveaway uh, of XRP, contact Ripple in the official website and just email them and say, hey, is this real? They're going to tell you no. Same thing with Binance or through Nano or Ledger or whoever else that, that is doing this. Contact them through their official website. Verify it. 99.999% of the time, they're not. So... That's the easiest way. Second thing is we need to get rid of all these scammers that are still here. So uh, in the comments section of every one of my videos, there's going to be a link that's going to say scam of the day. And the scam of the day, we're just going to, uh, this is all the different scams we removed. So thanks, everybody. Here's the new ones that we got to get rid of. And the reason why we're going to need to get rid of them is because this is a big year for digital assets. And as people come in, if they get screwed out of their money, one person tells 10, 10 tells 1,000, okay? And if we let that happen, then this industry or this space dies out. So let's make it a hospitable environment for when people come in. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna click on this link. It's gonna send us to an actual video, which is a scam. And what we're gonna do is first, we're gonna look at the comment section. And uh, this is all a scam. Looks like a scam, but we don't know for sure. What we're looking for is something that is a asymmetrical giveaway. What does that look like? It looks like this. If you send a thousand XRP to this address, wherever it is, you'll be airdropped 10,000 XRP back. If you send 5,000, you'll be airdropped 50,000 back. Look, no one's giving you free money. You're not special. Just remember that and it'll be okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to report it. I'm going to downvote it real quick. Click on these three dots. Look for the report because the scammers like to hide it. Then we're going to say spammer misleading. Choose one. Scams and fraud, and this applies the links. Click next, and all we're gonna say is this is a scam. Come on, YouTube, get on it, and we're gonna report. You can say whatever you want to. You can be as colorful as you want to be, but uh, that's all I usually put. And that's it. That's all you gotta do. If you could do that for the other four scams, that would be fantastic. And that's all I could really ask for. So again, thanks for participating, cleaning up the environment, making it hospitable for people coming in. Uh, if you like these types of videos, there's gonna be a couple that are gonna pop up. I don't know exactly what they are because they're curated for you personally by YouTube, who can't seem to do anything else besides <laughs> It's that they certainly can't get rid of their own scammers. And that's it. So thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one.